All right, so you're welcome back to your most authoritative weekly uh, business and economic analysis program, Business Focus Life here on TV3. Quickly, let me just introduce my guest to you, uh, Edu Osu Sarkodie. Um, he is with the Economics Department of the University of Ghana. He's joined us in the studio. Uh, later on, we'll also engage with uh, Dr. Godfrey Bokwin. He's head of uh, the Finance Department at the University of Ghana Business School. Um, would also later on be joined by an analyst uh, from First Bank Financial Services. And then also we'll speak on the phone lines with the financial analyst, Sydney uh, Casely Hayford, uh, to help us to do this analysis. Sakodia, uh, good evening to you and welcome to the studio. Good evening, it's always a pleasure to be here. Great to see you. Uh, so, uh, the biggest news for the day is that the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank has reduced the policy rate by 150 basis points to 21%. Um, was it expected? Did you expect this? That's great news. I was expecting it. Um, you remember when the policy rate was around 26%, you interviewed me and I said that it is one of the highest, in fact it was the second highest, just second to Malawi's 27%. Mm. And so we were always advocating for a reduction of the policy rate because of its implication on other macroeconomic variables. Because we say macroeconomic stability, mm. the policy rate is one of the key variables that we look at. So. Reducing it to 21% is good news, but I still maintain my point that it's still high. We should be having it around between 10 to 15%. So mm. I'm sure that the MPC members are working towards that. Uh, when we hit between 10 to 15%, then it will be very good for the economy. But this is also a welcoming news because um, it has been reduced. The Monetary Policy Committee often meets to uh, review the health of the economy. It's been meeting since uh, a lot high they increase the policy rate so that inflation will come down. So if the very thing that you are fighting is coming down, is dropping, then there's no need increasing the policy rate again. So I think that the major factor here is the drop in inflation. Currently it's around 12%, mm -hmm. which is a uh, welcoming news. I'm sure by the end of the year we might hit a single digit inflation if we, uh, the things go on the way it is. Mm -hmm. The second factor has been the treasury bill. Uh, the treasury bill rate has been going down, mm -hmm. and I think that is also uh, a contributory factor. The other one, I don't know where that variable is coming from, but mm -hmm. we always talk about it, the confidence in the economy. It looks like all of a sudden, the economy has gained some confidence on, on the part of local investors and even foreign investors. Uh, we had our exchange rate stabilized and then government also shifted from short-term borrowing to long-term borrowing. The short-term borrowing, we mean the treasury bill, the 91-day treasury bill, the 182. Government has shifted from that to the long-term borrowing. Remember, government issued five-year bond and 10-year bond and even 15-year bond. So these are all the dynamics playing, and I think that uh, this is a welcome news. It was expected based on this, uh, the happenings in the macroeconomic variable. We expect GDP growth rate to pick up. Mm. Uh, the first quarter of 2017, we had 6.6%, uh, which was very good, and higher than the 4.4% recorded in the previous year. Mm. Uh, the public debt, even though the nominal value uh, of I'm going to ask you hold on to that because <laughs> we'll get back to that okay. uh, discussion. Okay. But I need to find out if this... Uh, drop in the policy rates uh, can be attributed necessarily to uh, any f you know significant uh, management some economic management by this new government yes uh, like I said the confidence in the economy all of a sudden uh, there's some confidence in the economy when the election results were declared people even started uh, reducing prices of their items it, it shows that people were maybe anticipating something the managers of the economy should also be praised because if something goes on bad, we blame them. Mm. So if things are improving, we, they should take the credit for it. How so? so? Because w in terms of the, the Treasury bill rate, the Treasury bill rate has significantly been declining since uh, December 2016. Yes. You know, even before the elections up, up till now, we've yeah. seen that significant reduction. So how does that, uh, you know, become the doing of, of this government? You mean this current MP yes, government? Yes, this, this current government. Well, I, like I said, um, or, you, you or, mentioned or, the treasury bill, say, the drop in the treasury bill. Managers of the economy. I think that even before the change of government mm. in, in January, uh, like you said, the treasury bill rate had been uh, dropping, even inflation. Right, even inflation. Right. Mm. And even in the previous administration, mm. made a conscious effort mm. to shift mm. from short-term borrowing to long-term borrowing, mm. so as to release funds 
to the private sector, to you and I, who do want to borrow money to expand their businesses. So that might be an underlying factor. Mm. But I, my point still remains that uh, this administration should also take the credit for it because when it was high, we blamed mm. government for mm. not doing anything about it. But mm. now that it has been dropped, I think that they, 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 they've done something quite right. well. And they might okay. I'm going to come back to you. Uh, shortly, I'll be introducing to you uh, Ben Amwa. Uh, Benjamin Amwa is uh, an analyst with uh, First Bank Financial Services. But let me get on the phone lines now and also engage with Sydney Casey Hayford. He is a financial analyst. Sydney, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure you've been listening in to the discussion. And I've got to find out from you um, also if you think that um, this uh, sudden drop in, in the policy rate, as we've seen this year, happen. Th this is the third time. Is as a result of uh, sterling performance by managers of the economy? Obviously, thanks. Um, listen, I, I have always said, and I still maintain, that the uh, policy rate drop by the Bank of Ghana really has not had any impact on the economy of this country. Uh, it was used extensively by the previous government in an attempt to try and see if they could force it, uh, the rate down. But it never really worked. And every time there was a drop in the MPC rate, um, it never shifted anything. And the retail banks still continue to charge, charge their high rates. So I don't really see the purpose. It's a welcome sign that we have now dropped one and a half basis points. Um, but at the end of the day, we really need to see a, a, a better drop. And for me, the measure of whether or not government and the retail banks can come to stop. I'm afraid we've uh, uh, lost Sydney on the line. We'll, we'll, we'll try hard to get him back on the phone line. He's, ra he's raising quite some uh, mm -hmm. significant points there. But let me just introduce to you uh, Benjamin Amwa, uh, who is a financial analyst with First Bank Financial Services. Ben, uh, good to have you in the studio. Uh, would you want to try your hands on uh, this question <laughs> as to whether or not you know, this drop in the policy rates is as a result of the sterling performance of the managers of the economy, really? Um, I, I I don't think you can attribute it entirely to the economic managers or the managers of the economy per mm. se. I think it's based on economic indicators, and some of those indicators have shown a decline even before the election was held and was won in December 2016. Mm. Uh, we can name inflation, for mm. instance, and right. the stability we've seen in the city. It's actually mm. worse this year than it was last mm. year. Mm. So really, we can't attribute all of it to the <laughs> managers of the economy. Mm. But it is simply based on data that is being shown that the Bank of Ghana has reported and it's shown an improvement in the macroeconomic environment. Mm. That is what is drawing uh, the decline in the policy. So um, amongst all of us, and, and as Sidney rightly said, we, we can all agree that what will be of significant importance to us is when we begin to see it translate into interest rates. Of course. How, how does that happen? How will that happen? I think there's a problem with the policy transmission mechanism. I've heard that big English. Okay, so let's <laughs> translate it into normal English. Mm. What that means is that the policy rate has to influence interest rates mm. or lending rates mm. by the banks and the same and those companies. The problem is that there seems to be a divergence between the policy rates and the lending rates or the formula that the banks use to calculate the lending rates. Mm. Now, if the policy rate is not a huge component of that formula, then you can't expect it to you can't expect l lending rates to drop, even when policy rate is reduced. But we've say, always thought it's it. been a component. It is. But what is its significance within that component? Now, I know, for instance, that the Bank of Ghana, I mean, they won't really readily give out that kind of information, mm. um, as in the formula that banks use. Mm. Um, you'd, like, you'd have to probably be in the Treasury Department of a bank to be aware of that. But the truth is that the influence of the policy rate on the entire formula, or the outcome of that formula, is not as heavy as you would expect it to be. And mm. that is one of the reasons why the policy rates can go as low as 15% and we mm. still don't see a concurrent decline. Kindly hold on for me. Let me get rates. back on the phone lines with Sydney Casely Hayford. Sydney, uh, you're making a point. Quickly land on that. Yes, I was saying that um, for, as, for as long as the, the policy rate has not been able to influence that lending rate, it hasn't had much of an impact on our economy. And I think that the major uh, uh, issue we need to focus on is the Treasury bill rate. Currently, what is happening is the government is not borrowing domestically uh, on the 91 day bills and longer. So it's shifted the whole impact into bond, bond issuers. And that is what is cushioning the rate and is bringing the rate down. So retail banks don't really have any uh, 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 other alternative now. They must start lending into the economy, and businesses should be able at least to be able to borrow currently at about 12%. 
thirteen percent. And so if you if you can get rates at twelve plus three three basis points from above the CB rate, then it's not bad. So you know, 15%, 15% lending rates will at least start people getting back into the economy and borrowing more money. And that's what we need to kick start the process and get the, uh, get the whole economy bouncing back again. So, Sydney, are you confident that we will begin to see interest rates drop? Oh, yes, they will drop. But as long as government doesn't depend on the uh, local domestic borrowing uh, to store up its, its, uh, its deficit financing, interest rates will come down. There's no other alternative. Uh, the banks have been, have been depending heavily on uh, making easy money uh, with a high TV rate. When that starts coming down, it puts pressure on them to lend because that's the only reason why they are there, to lend money to the businesses in the economy. So I expect that it will come down. The policies are good, people are reacting, and it will come down. But some have said it's not just uh, about the, the policy rates, it's not just about the rate at which the commercial banks borrow from the central banks, but other factors, including the bank's overexposure, uh, uh, you know, is this not something we should begin to look at? Maybe perhaps that's why the, the rates are not coming down. The banks have other costs that impact on their operations. Yes, the banks have historic non-performing loans which they have service, and they overextended themselves. There's nothing they can do about it. They now have to manage that and, 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 and try and recover as much as they can from the, from the delinquent uh, businesses whom they lent the money to. Over a period of time, it will come through because we are still struggling at the moment to find other deposits which they can use to be able to defray those costs. But it will come down. My final question to you, Sydney, is about the country's total public debt. And we're told us that May this year it reached 137 billion uh, CDs. Uh, the report from the central bank shows that the debt stock increased by some 9.4 billion CDs in the three months from 127.8 billion CDs to 137.2 billion CDs. Um, it is not clear for now whether the increase was caused by fresh borrowing by government, the CDs depreciation, or some commitment that the government had to deal with. However, sources say the increase can be attributed to the recent $2.25 billion bond issued by government in April. This question was posed by Bernard Avler uh, to the president uh, last week. The vice president answered that question. He says, listen, don't worry at all. For as long as we have the, the fiscal deficit target within limits, we're going to achieve that. Don't really worry about the borrowing. Yes, hello? Yes, what do you say to that? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm inclined to agree with what uh, 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 Dr. Baumia said. The, the point is, these are all legacy debt. And even as we sit now, we're getting ready to issue another debt on the energy bond. That alone is 9 billion CDs, which we have to find. But once you are caught in this trap of debt, and it becomes a complete cyclical issue, the only thing you can do is to find other sources of money at a cheaper rate and then clear those debts so we can make enough space to be able to move on. Um, as to whether or not the, the, uh, the ratios and the analysis he did are correct, I really haven't looked at it from that perspective. But from my own interpretation, I think it's very, very simple. You owe so much money from history. You borrowed more and more. Somebody has to pay that money off. And the only way you can do it is to use the current uh, situation that you have borrow as cheaply as you can, and then move on. So one way or the other, the debt has to be stretched out, so that the burden is not today's impact. They have to be futuristic in order that we can continue. And then hopefully, measures that are put in place will enable the economy to boil up so that we can collect more tax revenues and we'll have enough surplus to be able to defray the expenses. That's the only way forward. Government has only two types of expenses to take care of at the moment. He has to pay the interest rate, and he has to pay salary, period. Thank you very much. Uh, Sydney Kisley, here, financial analyst. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, ben, I've got to take your reactions to this quickly. Um, he, he, he actually has a point there. The, 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 the truth is, like Dr. Baumia said, if you're able to keep our fiscal debt, it's the fiscal deficit that accumulates as debt. Mm. If you're able to keep it in check year on year on year, we are, we are supposed to see a reduction in debt. Mm. The problem is that it's too high. And, and all these borrowings were contained in the budget. Um, um, I, I think... Um, 
as of March 2017, mm. um, when the budget was read, what we saw was for the second quarter. Mm. So for the first quarter, it was, should I say, on the back of the budget that was read in November okay. 2016. Mm. So it wasn't really included in the budget. It okay. was only for the second quarter. Okay. So all of it fell in place. Mm. And I mean, most of it. Mm. And actually, for the 91 day, 182 day, they, they've actually borrowed less than they intended to. Okay. Partly because they were trying to drive interest rates lower. Mm. And they've succeeded in that. Mm. Um, I think the issue now is that debt, the debt problem is like the one problem that has become so sticky for the government. Mm. And it is so because it has accumulated to a level where it's very difficult for us to fall back. Now, it's good that the medium term strategy is helping us to reduce the interest rates. However, the, the quantum of debt is still a problem. And like he said, if you're going to issue this energy bond close to 10 billion, that's going to shoot the debt GDP ratio even mm. higher than it is now. Mm. And I have no idea how they're going to deal with that. But uh, he has a point, he has a point. But the truth is, it should be very difficult to deal with the debt issue. Mm. Chuck? We were told that borrowing per se is not wrong, mm. but what you use the money for. Mm. We've been borrowing all these years. By now, whatever we invested the borrowing into should be paying <laughs> themselves by now. We should be getting the returns. Mm. We are not so seeing financing the project. We are what is the self-financing project? We are not seeing the returns from those self-financing projects, yet government continues to borrow. We have a huge debt stock. Take it or leave it. Mm. We must deal with the debt. Mm. We must re-strategize. We must issue debt uh, bonds or loans at a lower rate to pay those at a higher rate. But I'm very much disappointed in mm. the two parties, the MBP mm. and the NDC, mm. fighting over who is borrowing more and who is borrowing less. We live in Ghana, a middle-income economy, mm. and we are fighting about who is borrowing more and who is borrowing less, mm. instead of thinking about how to raise tax revenue, thinking about how to raise domestic I revenue. I was just about to go there. I mean, the first uh, half of the year or first quarter, revenue collection has been poor. Our GDP estimate for this year is 200 billion cities. If we're able to collect 25%, if our revenue to GDP ratio is 25%, mm. you're talking about 50 billion Ghana cities. I think the average for sub-Saharan is about around 21, 22. It's 25. Mm. Okay. No, for developing countries, it's 25. Mm. And Ghana is a developing country. Ghana is a middle-income economy. Mm. You should be thinking of how to raise the revenue to GDP uh, we're ratio doing about from what, 17, 18, 16? Yeah. Yes, there are mm. about mm. to 25. Mm. That is, this should be our thinking, mm. not to be thinking about who is borrowing more and who is borrowing less. Mm. That we have missed the point. The managers of the economy must sit down, re-strategize, and look at various ways of raising revenue. We must look at the property tax. We must look at professionals who are not paying tax. We must go into the informal sector. All these things were part of the campaign promises of various political parties. We must put all their ideas together and be thinking of how to raise revenue domestically for how long are you going to depend on loans and, and you know, foreign aid and grants and others to help us for how long we need to deal with our problem ourselves we can't continue we are a sovereign country if you do that you'll be selling yourself out so but, we, 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 when we, we, you make this right. point i'm coming mm. when you make this point and people will come in and say but china is borrowing but us is borrowing but japan is borrowing these countries have the capacity to grow their economy and pay their debt, where is our capacity? How much do we gain from the oil? Two billion cities. How much do we pay on an interest? Ten billion cities compared to and ten. Where is our capacity? We need to develop our capacity. We need to grow our economy from the agric for manufacturing. We need to get the informal sector. How best we can tax their incomes? Get the professionals to tax them. Get property tax. Do all sorts of things to raise. Seal all the leakages. The leakages are self. The leakages are the internal revenue collection agency. The leakages are the toll a areas. You collect 100 cities, you report 80 cities, 20 is gone. The leakages in the system. This should be our concern. So, Ben, we've, we've gone past the first half of the year. Uh, there's been relative stability in the exchange rate. Uh, we've seen inflation go down. The policy rate consistently for the third time has gone down. Should we begin to get excited? Are we on target to achieve, achieving our fiscal deficit? Um, 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 so far, so good. But I, am, I wouldn't get excited just yet. Mm. Data as at end of April shows that the government is within target. Mm. They've done a fiscal deficit of 1.5%. That's again a target of 22 So that's good. Growth target? No, I mean the deficit target, I mean, fiscal deficit. Yeah, aside yeah. fiscal growth, are we on target? Growth is also on point. Mm. Um, they, were, they were estimating 6.3%. I think mm. first quarter came in at 66 mm. So that's good. The problem why, the reason why I wouldn't want to get excited yet is the chunk of expenditure that can create problems will be coming in September. 
when the free SHS is launched, mm. when they begin paying teachers in uh, nursing training allowances in mm. bulk for all the various years, mm. you know now they've started paying for some particular years, mm. they're going to start paying for mm. all the years. That's when the problem is going to start coming in. And that's when I don't know if they'll be able to check themselves if revenue is still not at the level where they expected it to be. Mm. You see, the problem is, is uh, you, you, you focus a certain revenue level and you focus a certain expenditure level. If revenue suffers a shortfall, you should cut down on your expenditure as well. Mm. But if they've promised everybody they're going to launch free SHS in September, as well as pay teacher and nursing training allowances, I don't know if they're going to be able mm. to cut down on those promises. Mm. Mm. So the, the figures are looking good, but I don't want to get excited yet. And the problem is that in Ghana, what, I have, what our research has shown is that it's always the fiscal deficit that drives investor confidence. Mm. The moment they begin falling outside of targets, the city begins to depreciate, inflation starts going up, everything starts going haywire again. So I won't get excited until that. Ben has been cautiously optimistic uh, about our, our, our growth targets, our fiscal deficit target. I'll come back to you, uh, Edward Sarkozy, but let's listen to Dr. Godfrey uh, Bachman, uh, who is the head of the finance department at the University of Ghana Business School, uh, on his thoughts uh, on uh, the recent announcement uh, by the Monetary Policy Committee. Professor Bokpin says the lack of physical discipline in the past led to the high monetary policy rate in the country as compared to an average of 10% in neighboring countries. He also indicates the gradual and marginal reductions in the policy rate in the last six months was expected. If we are talking about uh, uh, a enabling environment, then we are looking at interest rate that is lower than 10%. But even though we've seen the policy rate come down, we haven't seen the lending rate coming down. That we are not there yet because 21% uh, is, is still very high. Government's development plans are hinged on private sector growth, which is aimed at total growth of the economy. Hence, reducing the policy rate is the way to go. A lower policy rate should lead a lower cost of borrowing and subsequently reduce inflation. The head of department and finance at the University of Ghana Business School is of the view the central bank has to strengthen the transmission mechanism in order for the policy rate to reflect on the market. It's not significant enough to cause um, a base drift in the markets necessarily. General economic instability also affects the asset quality of banks. But the point is that as government works hard to stabilize the economy, and improve on the macroeconomic stability, build on that to transform the economy. We also expect that this will translate to improving the, the, the asset quality of banks and also enable businesses, individuals, customers to be able to pay back their loan and then their interest. Professor Bokpin has advised the central bank to have a look at the base rate formula in order to have a comprehensive approach to dealing with monetary policy indicators. The central bank uh, has, has approved currently for banks uh, in terms of determining their base rates. We need to interrogate the formula and, and make it much more responsive to the monetary policy rate, either a weighted rate uh, in terms of the policy rate, treasury rate, and then other variables in the market probably will be. But the current formula itself does not aid significantly the transmission mechanism of the policy rate. With inflation down to 12.1 percent, inflation expectations lowering, the inflation target band of 6 to 9 percent is achievable and there's more room for policy rate to come down. All right, so you had uh, Professor Buckpin there uh, on his take uh, on the announcement by the Monetary Policy Committee uh, to reduce the policy rate by 150 basis points. Let me just take your reactions to that as well as your uh, expectations for fiscal deficit as well as uh, uh, for growth. I think, I think we are all concerned about the effect of the policy rate on lending rate. Um, if Japan is doing 0.9 percent and other countries are doing over, uh, a little over 10 percent, our neighbors Kenya and uh, Nigeria are doing better than us, I think that we should sit down as a country and see our 38 percent is very high. It's very, very high, meaning that if you go to borrow 100 cities today, in a year's time, you're going to pay 38 cities more. And, and I think that wha whatever the problem is, <clears throat> we must fill in the gap and solve the problem. As to the targets, the fiscal deficit targets, um, I believe that uh, with discipline, government will be able to achieve it. We, we're still in the IMF program. Um, the President, His Excellency Nanado, has also promised to uh, protect the public purse he, he, as he's, he was containing his campaign promise. So I believe that with this macroeconomic stability, 
with policy rates coming down, um, if it has any effect on the lending rate, with treasury bill rate coming down, if we're able to stabilize these macroeconomic variables and grow the GDP to some extent, we would be able to and slow down the borrowing, you know, because if, if you slow down the borrowing, and and, and it, it will reduce the, uh, the the public debt. So we are likely to hit the target. The other point I would want to make is to, even if you want to borrow at all, we must borrow at a lower rate. You know, we must also prioritize. We must know our priority. The basic principle in economics is scale of preference. The things we want are many. The money we need to meet these things is limited in supply. Mm. Therefore, you do your scale of preference. You list your items, the priority ones on top. So we must prioritize as a country. Are we looking for free SHS? Or we are looking at quality basic education? Or we are looking at creating jobs? Or we are looking at building our roads, or we are looking at building strong railway system to link the two cities, Kumasi and Accra. Or we are, what are we thinking about? What is our priority? Are we thinking of putting money in the pockets of the individuals as people? Are we thinking of reducing the import taxes? Are we thinking of revamping the agriculture sector? Are we thinking of revamping the manufacturing sector so that we can create jobs? So our priorities must be established sure. first. Okay. and discipline ourselves. I'm sure we will reach the target. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, Edu Ousa Kodier is with the Economics Department of the University of Ghana. Uh, also to Benjamin Amwa, uh, financial analyst with First Bank Financial Services. On the phone lines, we spoke to uh, Sidney Casely Hayford, also a financial analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me in studio. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll go for a mover segment, and my guest is the Chief Executive Officer of Awinbora Spicy Kebab. Start achieving already, right? Just wait, we'll be back shortly. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and welcome to your favorite program, the Mover Segments Live here on TV3. Tonight, we are inside in Kuma Flats, and I'm going to be speaking to a young man who is making a lot of difference in his society, supporting people, yeah. and creating jobs around him. I'm talking about the Chief Executive Officer of Awimbora Spicy Kebab. His name is Jacob Awimbora. Jacob, it's good to be in your office. Thanks very much for inviting us here. Thank you. Great. So, Jacob, tell us a bit about yourself. I'm Jacob Awimbora, coming from Upper East Treaty, Bongo District. When I came across 1990, when I was young, I came, I started this work with my uncle at Kolebu, opposite maternity. I worked with him a while, then I start see that there's a difference, I can prove myself and I opened this place, that's year 2000. In 2000 you opened this place. Yes, please. Why did you decide to open your own place? Because of this place, I was coming to open my own brand because I see that I'm now growing and I have to get married, I have to get my own life. So I see that I can't be with my uncle a very long time. In the same time, I see I experienced that this work, I can do it and benefit it from this job. Mm. I can make life on it. Right. How much money do you need to set up this place? This place I, I start to set up, it's not big money. I started it this guest single table and a report and guest single seat mm. from the starting. And, and you're doing this all by yourself, alone? For the starting, I do it by myself. Mm. Taking and like one year and I start to employ people. So how many workers do you have now? I have workers. We have eight workers or nine workers now. About eight to nine workers. Yeah. And do you have only this branch? You've got branches scattered across. Thank you. I have branches across. How many branches? Four branches. I have one. Achimata, Jerusalem, I have one, Kolebu, Agenda, I have one, Akko Johnson, and I have one, La Adi Place, that is Mataiko. 
Mm. And I have one, Atiko Johnson. Mm. So, so these are essentially your workers here at the headquarters. This is the headquarters uh, of your kebab uh, company. Now, do you pay them monthly? Thank you. I pay them daily. Daily. Thank you. Mm. And what gets them excited? What gets them working for you? No, because of the payment, they see that it's good, and they see that this work we can help ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I see. So you've been doing this since 2000. Yes. Tell me about the kebab business in Ghana. Does it sell? Is it profitable? Thank you very much. The kebab business is good. It depends the look. You know, it depends the location, the area you are, and it depends how you do it. Mm. How do you do it? If you do it quality, you get customers. Now I need to ask you this question because we've got lots of kebab sellers across the country. Lots of them. What makes you stand out? Now, this business are always serious on it. All right, so I've got to apologize profusely for that uh, break in the transmission. Uh, it's due to some technical difficulties. We'll try and bring you this interview uh, some other time, but we apologize profusely for, for that break in transmission. Uh, just when it, it, it almost got exciting, uh, we had to cut it. Uh, apologies to you all. Uh, so we'll return in studio, and uh, let me just quickly introduce you, uh, my guest for the final lap of the show. Uh, just it is a research analyst with First Bank Financial Services, also been joined by Ben Amwaje, also a financial analyst. Gentlemen, thank you uh, for your time. Um, just as I start off with you uh, on the commodities market, how is the price of gold turned uh, cocoa faring? For gold, um, for some time now we've been a bit worried about how gold will be trending because of the fact that the Federal Reserve in the U.S. have increased their policy rate. But recent data from the U.S. suggests that we might not have cause to worry because um, retail sales have, have not picked up as we expected. And the thinking behind the fact that the federal rate will continue increasing its, its, its policy rate, as we've seen in the past, might slow down. So as a rule of thumb, many times the interest rates in the U.S. are high. It affects um, gold price. There's some form of inverse relationship. And now the thinking is that the initial initial idea of having to increase the rate by the Federal, federal Reserve will not, will not hold for now. So last week we saw a rebound in the price of gold. And the thing behind gold is that, you know, Trump is having some issues with, with some investigations in terms of mm. issues with the U.S. elections and relationship Russia with Russia and, and all that. Yeah. And that caused the, the U.S. dollar to weaken. And another thing is that when the U.S. dollar is not strong enough, it also tends to give a boost to gold. So last week, that gave gold price a bit of a notch. But going forward, we will still have to see whether the Federal Reserve would still push up ahead with their initial comments they've made in terms of increasing its, its monetary policy. And what about cocoa? Uh, okay, for cocoa as well, um, for the past couple of months, we've all been aware of the fact that it's likely for this production year there will be and overproduction in terms of um, output coming from Ghana and mainly Cote d'Ivoire. But what we've seen over the past one month is that for manufacturers in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in Europe, I mean, those who produce confectionaries, they've surprisingly increased their demand. So that is more or less offsetting the perceived or the notion we've had over the past couple of months that supply is going to, is going to cause prices to fall. So for the past week, we actually saw that offsetting influence for the first time, affecting the price. So, despite the fact that everybody is expecting the, the the price of cocoa to go down because of overproduction, because there is also an inverse demand on on the part of those who use the cocoa beans to manufacture co um, chocolate and other products, the balance has caused the price to to increase. And going forward, you should see that sustain for for a while because previously, right. almost all the market players have already sacked themselves and imputed the fact that, look, we are going to have a very bumper harvest this season. Mm. So with this demand coming up, if it's sustained for a while, it's likely cocoa. It will not rebound significantly, but it should keep the price in check. 
Uh, ben, are we still seeing that buoyancy in the uh, stock market now that, I mean, treasury bill rates obviously have, have become uh, a disincentive for most I people? I think the wrong question. Mm. You, you, <laughs> it's more than buoyancy. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> the stock market is higher, is, is more than 30% now mm, mm, from year open. Mm. That's an extraordinarily impressive performance. And mm. in July alone, from the 1st of July up to today, the market has gained close to 19%. Amazing. Exactly. And mm. it has been driven by banking stocks, but particularly by Standard Chartered Bank. And we've seen that rich highs uh, that it hasn't reached in a very long time, mm. at least not since the throughs of 2014. Mm. Uh, that is what has been driving the stock markets now. But the other stocks that are also doing well, Farm Milk and Goyal as well, have also posted very strong performance. Uh, we haven't seen the second quarter results yet. We're mm. expecting them throughout the course of this week. Mm. Uh, as to whether that rally can be sustained, we will see by the end of this. I, I need to still establish why we're seeing this excitement of the stock market. I think from the very beginning of the it, it, actually it wasn't from the beginning of the it was from November last year, mm. when interest rates started to trend downwards. Mm. It made sense for fund managers, especially those who manage uh, equity mutual funds and pension mm. fund managers, to move some of their monies into the stock market, mm. especially at a time when some of the banks have started posting positive results. Mm. And so that was what drove the initial excitement in the market. I think some of the companies have been able to sustain that interest because they have continually posted increasing profits. Mm. And that is one of the other reasons. So lower interest rates and then the companies themselves are actually doing well. Mm. So that's what has been driving the stock market. So we've got to wait to see the second quarter yes, results? We, we, we believe that mm. it won't be good across board. Mm. However, there are some companies that we know post good performance. And I think some of the market players are trying to, uh, should I say, take the lead in mm. expectation that some of these companies who post good performance, they are, you know, bidding higher and higher for those stocks. Mm. I think Standard Chartered is one of those companies. Mm. So, uh, I mean, we, we were here some time earlier and spoke about why you know, the impact of the the Securities and Exchange Commission mm -hmm. not, uh, having, a not having a board and, and how it would impact on the it's stock it's market and all that, it, it hasn't appeared to have had much uh, impact. Oh, it, it doesn't affect the performance of the stock market. Mm. What we felt would, would have been Just a new investment. That, exactly, mm. because this is the best time for anybody to raise money on the mm. stock market. I mean, mm. When the stock market mm. is like this, mm. you can raise money mm. very easily. Mm. Mm. And yet, companies are not being allowed to do that because there's no sec board to actually approve whatever listing mm. you want to create mm. in the market. Mm. And that's a problem. Mm. You see, if this fault is, I mean, if the rally dies down mm. or the excitement recedes, mm. it will be they will come very difficult again for people to raise money in the stock market. But, but, but why are the managers not attaching that much uh, of importance I, to this? I have, I have, I, I'm not really sure what the problem is. Some of mm. these things, you know, is political appointments, so it takes a little time, but I'm surprised because a lot of boards have been appointed, including Coco Board and mm. even GMPC, I believe. Mm. I, have, I have no idea why SEC and MPRA still do not have these things. Mm. I think the finance minister should come out very quickly with that because mm. It's, it's like a window of opportunities passing by mm. that could have benefited the market very mm. well. And if they are really geared towards developing the capital markets, like they have always said, then there's an opportunity for them to prove. Justice, with all the performances we've seen with gold, cocoa, and oil, um, what's its relativity to the local market in terms of Ghana? Okay. In relation to Ghana, we've realized this year that due to the coming on stream of the 10 oil field mm. and quite recently the Sankofa Jami field, there will naturally be a lot of attention on the performance of crude oil. And if you check the fiscal data from, or the financial data from the Bank of Ghana, realize that gradually our imports of crude are reducing. So it will be in our best interest to hope for prices to, to actually increase because we will hope to make more revenue from, from crude exports. Mm. Unfortunately, prices have trended downwards for, for most parts of 2017. It's moving around $45, $46 dollars per barrel now. And it's looking to be extremely difficult in terms of the price because just this month we are learning that for, for even for OPEC, who have promised that they will be reducing the, their supply of crude oil onto the market just to force price up, they themselves are having to supply more just because they want to lose market share. Mm. So if you're looking at Ghana in terms of crude oil, it's going to be increasingly difficult for us to at least make more revenue. Mm. If you're comparing this year to last year, we'll still make more because mm. on the output side, we are producing more. Mm. But on price, things are not looking too good. Mm. And the same goes for, for, for Coca-Cola as well. As I mentioned, the price has been, has been trending down because of the, the idea or the, the fact that for Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we are expected to overproduce this year. Mm. The increase that we saw last week it's good, but we don't think it will be sustained for, for a long term. Mm. So in terms of price as well, we realize that for cocoa as well, we will most likely suffer. The good thing is that if you look at our revenue performance for the first five, six months of this mm. year, even though we are not doing well on price, because the output is 
mm. high, mm. and even for gold as well, mm. it tends it tends to offset the fact that on the price on the price front you're not doing too well. Mm. So comparatively, in terms of export revenue, you've done better in 2017 mm. than in 2016. Mm. But again, for an important commodity like crude oil, mm. you, and even for cocoa. Realize that the fact that we are overproducing is for causing the, the price on the global market to, to reduce. Right. So going forward, I think it's something that um, both governments, Ghana and Kodovo, have, have for a long time been talking about how to have a system where instead of being price takers, mm -hmm. we can be price makers. And I'm mm -hmm. sure it's something that's on the table. And for the past couple of months, we've had some meetings have been organized, and we'll mm -hmm. see what will come of that. Mm -hmm. we, we need to be price makers. And Ben, we've often talked about the, the low price of, of, of gold mm -hmm. on yeah, its impact on the budget mm -hmm. and government's own projections. But we haven't really talked about the, 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 the oil companies themselves and their projections in terms of investment into new oil fields. How do, how do these impact on them? It has hit them tremendously. Mm. I think even more than the government budgets. Okay, no, for a country like Ghana, mm. honestly, the effect of lower oil prices on us has not been as harsh as, as on some companies like Talo or mm. Halliburton. Mm. So some of those companies have had to cut staff mm. and expenditure mm. and made some mm. really strong changes. Mm. And I think the problem... Um, um, what allows us sometimes to get away with it is um, what happens is sometimes the government self forward. They self forward some of these things. When I say self forward, uh, they, they, they sell the product even before it's available at specific prices. Mm -hmm. So even if there's a decline, they still tend to enjoy mm -hmm. these prices. So and if you look at the, so market, the hedging, the hedging thing, right. it's kind of mm -hmm. like hedging, next, no especially, but mm -hmm. you know. The truth is, if you look at Bank of Ghana's data, you realize that we seem to have benefited from that, especially for gold, I think. Yeah. You realize that the realized prices, even as at now, is still a little higher than the market price that we are seeing now, which mm. means we probably sold them at a, at a specific price. So sometimes the effect on us is not that sharp. Mm. And like Justice said, it is becoming increasingly obvious that we are now a net exporter of oil instead of a net importer. It's always been obvious. <laughs> So instead of praying for lower oil prices, mm. uh, it will help the rest of us if prices are lower because mm. you know fuel prices at the, uh, at the pump will be lower. Mm. But for the government's budget and for its and, and, and for its revenue targets, it's beginning to look like it's better if oil prices are actually higher. The government's revenue targets were based on an oil price of fifty six dollars. It's currently been at forty eight or forty five. Yeah. And it's you're talking about benchmark revenue. Exactly, the benchmark target, revenue right. for crude. Mm. And it's been below fifty four, I think three months now. Mm. That means that we are at risk of underperforming in the oil sector again this mm. year. And the budget figures from the Ministry of Finance as at the end of April show that we have actually underperformed in that sector. And I think partly because of the price. Look at how look at how oil prices virtually you know, ramped up Nigeria's economy and shook, shook the, the very foundation on which the, the economy rested. I, I'm beginning to ask myself whether Ghana should have had, you know, enough oil like Nigeria. You know, even with our current situation, look at the sort of crisis we are, we're experiencing. You know, <laughs> ours is even better because we are not fully dependent on oil. We still have that's the point. As you were very much dependent on <laughs> we, oil, we would have been in trouble. We mm. would have been in trouble. I mm. think that's one of the reasons why we've had perennial mm. underperformance in the budget over the last three years has been because of the sharp decline in oil prices that mm. occurred over 2014 mm -hmm. and has persisted since then. And I think we came to depend heavily on oil. Uh, like, like like I said, we are not as bad as Nigeria anyway, mm. but still, it's a problem we, we have to deal with. Oil, we can't do much about. Mm. The advantage lies in cocoa, mm. because together with Cameroon and Cote d'Ivoire, we command almost 70% right. of primary exports mm. of cocoa. So we, let's command the price as well. We, and we should. Mm. OPEC could do that with oil with less than 70% market mm. share. Even now, mm. they are below 50%. They are mm. still struggling to mm. do the same thing. Mm. We have excess of 70%. We mm. should be able to do it. And funny enough, OPEC is like different countries spread all over the world. We, Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon, are like just around the same area. We share the same culture, we share the same thinking, we are both, we are all West Africans. It shouldn't be difficult for us to put up a system where we actually become price makers mm. instead of price takers mm. on the cocoa global market. Uh, so my final question to both of you, it's becoming increasingly clear that OPEC uh, is, is able to do very little with regards to the price mm -hmm. uh, of, of oil on the, on the world market, especially because of what, what's happening in America and its continuous production of shale oil. Um, so what is the future, really, for, for, for us? Uh, depend less on oil 
mm. and make sure that we use the oil money very well mm. before it even gets worse than it is now. Mm. Because the Americans look like they're not backing down, mm. and it looks like Nigeria, Iraq, and Libya are all on track to increase oil production from where it is now, mm. which means that there might be further downward pressure on oil prices. We mm. can't depend on oil, and if we're going to get any revenue from oil, we have to use it in the very best possible way. We have to invest it in things that actually get us money back, mm. not just expenditure. Right. That's the way forward. Justice? For yeah, I think along those lines, we need to further diversify our economy more. And it's good. Oil is more or less cheap revenue. You don't mm. really have to do a lot of thinking to get revenue. Once you have your pumps there, they will pump the oil for you. Depending on the price, you can sell and get your revenue. The main thing that will determine what a good government is, is how well you're able to invest the funds. You're able to diversify your economy in such a way that after 20 years, 30 years, there are no oil fields in Ghana. You would have made revenue for those number of years. If you can more or less develop another industry based on the revenues you've made, you will more or less be stable. You didn't have to all, uh, be, be, be depending on the, the fact that there, there, there's oil or there's no oil. So the main thing has to do with the fact that we need to further diversify our economy. And we should bear in mind that we are not going to be oil exporters for a long time. We are doing limited volumes. Even for countries that have done very significant volumes, they are feeling the pinch of the declining oil price situation. So we need to further diversify and make sure that at some point, if we are no more crude oil exporters, we will still have made wise investment that can more or less feed into the future generations. Benjamin Amoyje is a financial analyst uh, as well as uh, Edu, uh, oh, I beg your pardon, uh, Justice Edu, uh, who's a research analyst with First Bank Financial Services. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. And apologies once again for our inability to bring you the full um, episode of our mover segment. We surely will bring that to you in our subsequent uh, programming. Uh, thank you very much for watching. My name is Paul Kusiasari. Immense appreciation to the technical team and to my director. Um, we'll see you hopefully, uh, God willing, next week. Uh, stay tuned for News 360.